Understanding the psalm or the song. Understanding the psalm. Um, throughout Hebrew literature, Hebrew poetry, uh, one of the chief characteristics is referred to as parallelism. All right? Parallelism is just a fancy way of saying laying two ideas side by side. Okay? Those words may be, those, those two lines of thought may be synonymous. Okay? In other words, I may say to my wife, I love you more than anything in this world. There is nothing that means more than you. Now, I've just made two different statements that could stand independent of each other, but they complement each other. They're saying the exact same, I love you more than anything in this world. There is nothing that compares to you. Exact same thing, different words, but they, they're, they emphasize, they strengthen what I'm trying to communicate. Okay? That's what we see with this idea of parallelism. Um, we see this throughout the book of uh, the Song of Songs. We see this really throughout the Old Testament and some of the New Testament. Um, in Song 5 and verse 15, Song of Solomon chapter 5 and verse 15, notice this, His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. Well, the cedar trees of Lebanon, first of all, picture Lebanon populated with forest of these, these magnificent trees and how grand it would look and how majestic it would be. And then the strength of the cedar trees, that's, that's him and her eyes. Okay, you see this parallelism. The counten his countenance, his appearance is as Lebanon. It's majestic. Excellent as the cedars. Okay, this is what we see throughout. And it's, it's very uh, emotional, um, it's very impassioned. That's what we're going to find out. Uh, you might make just a side note. I've got to note the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1, 46 through 45. Uh, and notice here Mary's words and her response to Elizabeth. Uh, and you'll see a lot of the, in fact, Luke chapters 1 and 2, uh, very Hebrew in their tone, whereas 3 through 24, very Greek in their tone. But you see this, this parallelism there. It's very expressive, okay, as she praises God uh, in this particular text. Different forms of parallel. Yes, sir. Um, just thinking about the Greek and Hebrew language, uh, compared to the English language, they didn't have punctuation, like exclamation points and all that other good stuff, so the repetitiveness would show the emphasis of the, of the text. Okay, Jesse making the point, in our English language, we have punctuation. Right? We know when to pause, we know when to stop. Uh, we know when to emphasize, we know when to question. Uh, not necessarily the case with the Hebrew language and the Greek language. And so that repetition then emphasizes that. Um, there's a couple of different types of parallelism that I want to mention. There's five or six different forms of parallelism that you might see. Synonymous parallelism, I think it kind of explains itself. Um, Two, two particular thoughts that are stated that are very similar, okay? Very similar. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 2, and the Proverbs uh, full of this type of parallelism. Thou art snared, this is Proverbs 6, 2, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken by the words of thy mouth. Well, you really just see a change of one or two words. The point is a repetition for the point of emphasizing the truth. Um, you ever said something and as soon as it came out of your mouth, you thought, oh, I wish I could have that back. Okay. Sometimes we snare ourselves by the words that we say. Okay. So I'm just, I'll tell you what, the book of Proverbs, it, it's not necessarily for the life to come as, for the, as much as it is for the life now. Okay. It's practical wisdom of living now. Now that's going to carry over for us, but it's for today. Then you have what's referred to as antithetic parallelism, which is just the opposite of synonymous parallelism. Words that are opposite. So you would, you would have the truth and then uh, what is uh, error or, or opposites maybe, not necessarily truth versus error, but the opposites are stated to emphasize the truth. Here, here's an example, Proverbs 14, 34. Okay? Both of these statements are true, but they're opposite of each other. Righteousness exalteth the nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. Okay? Now, the emphasis is the same thing. 
All right? But you see, they're, they're opposite statements. And so you clearly opposing the good and the bad to emphasize a particular truth. You're going to see a lot of this imagery. Again, we're just going to scratch the surface of the surface of the song of songs this morning in this class period. So some of these things I'm, I'm giving you so that when you continue this, a study of this book, okay, you can start maybe to see some of this parallelism and some of the imagery, a lot of metaphorical language, a lot of imagery that we see in the book. Again, just briefly, uh, some of this imagery in metaphors that play a large role in this song of songs. Um, there, a metaphor is just two, two particulars uh, that are compared to each other. Uh, the most well known in the Old Testament, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord isn't a shepherd, well he is a shepherd in a sense, but not a shepherd watching literal sheep, but we get the idea. Our Lord is our shepherd. There's the protection, there's the guidance, there's the provisions, okay? The most well known perhaps in the New Testament, behold the Lamb of God. There is Jesus who is the Lamb of God, okay? When you think of a lamb, what comes to mind with regards to scripture? A sacrifice. He is the sacrifice that no man could bring for himself, but that God brought. Jesus also would speak metaphorically of himself. I am the door to the sheepfold. I am the good shepherd. You see this uh, often throughout the book. There are metaphors of geography, metaphors of nature, animals, plants, trees. Some of them are going to uh, seem a little bit um, humorous, uh, make us scratch our heads. We have to understand what we're reading here in the song is cultures centuries before. All right, now let's just notice just a few of these. Then we're going to get into uh, the book itself. Look at chapter 1 and verse 9. I don't know if my wife would appreciate this. I have compared thee, O oh my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. We're going to, we're going to talk about that, a little bit, that particular verse a little bit more. But if I told my wife, I, I compare you to horses, I don't know if that would go over very well. Okay, but in that culture, and we'll see how the, the meaning of this shortly, uh, she understood it was, a, it was a compliment. Chapter 4 and verse 1, Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks, behind your hair, your locks of hair, your eyes. Okay, talking about the beauty. But then look at this, thine eyes like the fish pools in Heshbon. Well, I don't know if my wife would appreciate it if I said your eyes remind me of fish pools. Okay, talking about the color the deepness, the richness of the eyes. Um, chapter 7 and verse, uh, well, we just uh, noted there chapters. Let, let's look at 4 and verse 1. I, I, I've read the end of 7, 4. Go back to 4, <coughs> verse 1. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is a flock of goats. Well, I know my wife wouldn't appreciate it if I said, man, your hair looks like a flock of goats. Now, the tone of voice might have something to do with that. Um, <laughs> The point I'm making here, the imagery, a lot of imagery, parallelism, it's very poetic. It's emphasizing. It's very emotional. It's very impassioned, okay? This is a man and a woman engaged at the beginning, married at the end, speaking to one another. And here's what they're doing. They're stirring emotions in each other. They're developing this relationship among one another. Uh, they are reassuring each other that my love for you is true. My love for you is exclusive. And I want to be with you forever. And I want to find time that it's just you and I so I can talk to you and I can listen to you. And I can find out more about you. Now, some of the men maybe are saying right now, I've been married for years. And I've got, you know, two children, three children. I have seven children. You know, I got it. That's what some of the men are thinking. I got this. And the wives are sitting there thinking to themselves, please help him. <laughs> okay? He's going to help all of us. In fact, I don't mean to embarrass my wife, uh, but you know, when you read and study, you put things into action. You apply what you read and study. Isn't that right, Jared? You, you put it into action. Uh studying and preparing for this particular class, I'm, I've been trying to make a point to be more expressive, verbal to my wife, um, commenting on her looks, 
reassuring her that she's the only one. She came to me yesterday, Jared, and she said, you kind of upped your game since you've been studying Song of Solomon. <laughs> this book, though, this song, the greatest song that Solomon ever wrote, even in his own eyes, though written centuries ago, will benefit us today. Okay? Now, with those things being said, here's the outline there, you go to commentary after commentary after commentary, and there's various different kinds of outlines. We're going to follow the most basic, the simplest, uh, and I think the best. I'm a very simple man. Uh, Brother Denny Petrillo uh, provided this outline, and I thought it was really the best. In chapter 1, begin with verse 1 through chapter 3, verse 5. Okay, that is courtship and dating. And we're going to draw really the majority of the points because a lot of the points that you're going to, we're going to see in courtship and dating, you know, those things need to carry over into marriage. Now, I'll sometimes talk about my wife and say, refer to her as my girlfriend. Somebody say, I like that coat you've got on, that jacket. My girlfriend got me this. Well, the person I'm talking to, if they don't know I'm married, they may think I'm dating. No, my wife. We need to, we need to be dating even after the I do's. So a lot of these things that we're going to pull out of these first two or three chapters... You know, even though it falls under courtship and dating, apply, applicable to us today. Chapter 3, verse 6, through the first verse of chapter 5, the wedding and the honeymoon. That's what we see in that particular uh, section. And then the final section from verse 2 of chapter 5 through the end of the book, chapter 8 and verse 14, after the honeymoon, building a lasting relationship. Now, that would be an outline for the book. I think that it is very practical and would help us our, the lessons that I'm going to take come primarily from courtship and dating, uh, some from after the honeymoon, building a relationship. <clears throat> um, how many do we have in here that are of a youthful nature? Uh, no, Aaron, I'm sorry, brother. Uh, that are of a youthful nature. Let's say under 20. Okay. It's okay if you can put your hands up a little bit higher. We have a few under 20. What about, say, 20s to 30s? 20s to 30s that are, aren't married, that are still maybe in the... Okay, all right. So we're going we're gonna to talk about some things that, that apply especially, particularly to you, but in as much as we should still be dating. And sometimes we take... Do we not do this, men? When we get married, we start to take some things for granted that we used to do. See, we would, go, we would go above and beyond to say and do things to endure, to draw that woman to us. And then when we're married, it's like, nah, I ain't got work. I, let me give you an example of that. I'll use myself. It's not going to embarrass you, I promise. Yeah. Uh, it's been a few years ago. And uh, my sons, my three sons, I don't know, Jesse, you might have been in this too. I don't, I don't think you were. But I know you weren't. My sons, because y'all were in school at the time, three boys, Curtis, Anthony, and Fred. And then uh, another young man who was, and his wife were staying with us, and his name is Patrick. They were all on the floor doing their push-ups and doing all these exercises, and they had something on the TV. It was like one of these extreme type of workouts. And I'm sitting over here in the recliner. Like, man, y'all are crazy. No way I'm, I did something like that, I'd, I'd be in the emergency room inside of five minutes. And uh, they're, they're just getting after it. And finally, Patrick just stops and says, what am I doing? I'm married. I don't have to do this anymore. <laughs> well, that's our mindset sometimes. Isn't it? We get married, I don't have to worry about it. I'm married. We take things for granted. Worst thing in the world we can do is take our mate, our wife, our husband for granted. Worst thing we can do. Because when we take them for granted, I can promise you there's somebody in the shadows ready to step in. And we can world proof our home and our relationship and our marriage if we'll read these things and study them and make application. All right, let's look at some practical lessons from the Song of Songs. What, what time do I have to stop? Uh, there'll be one bell at about uh, 10 after and then two at Okay, about 10 after. we got to fly. Okay, here we go. Let's start with this thought, making yourself attractive. Now, if you're dating, if you're in that dating age, you're already working on it. You're making yourself attractive. When you're married, you say, I don't have to do that. Yeah, we need to keep on doing that. All right? Making yourself attractive. Look at verse, chapter 1 and verse 3. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, 
Thy name as his ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee. The women are attracted to you because of these things. Now, I want to make one point, which I believe is a very salient point here, that we never think about with regard to making ourselves attractive to others, and that is a good reputation. I tell you what, you're never going to find, men, you're never going to find a good woman, a Christian woman, if you don't have a good reputation. You just hang it up. You may find all kinds of women that are attracted to you, but if you don't have a good reputation, you won't find a good woman. And young ladies, if you don't have a good reputation, oh, you'll find all kinds of men. Number one, they're not going to want a lasting relationship with you. And number two, you're not going to find a good man if you don't have a good reputation. This is what we see here. Notice, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Thy name is as ointment poured forth. We have to maintain a good reputation. When you're young, the decisions that you make, um, how you live, how you conduct yourself before other people, you're already building what your reputation is going to be 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Now, now, I want to make a point here with this. Just put your finger right here and let's go to the book of Proverbs. If I start talking fast, I apologize. I've got a lot I want to get through. I can tell already I'm not going to get it all. Proverbs chapter 1. And let's make a point to those who are younger, those who are still at home, or maybe if you're not at home, you're still under the influence of your parents or guardians, whatever the case may be. Look at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. My son, and you can apply this to son or daughter, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Listen to what your parents are telling you, how to live your life, how to conduct yourself, language to use, tone to use when you speak, friends to surround yourself with, Places to go, places to avoid. Listen to them. Listen to what they say. Why? Look at verse 9. For they, what? The instruction of the father and the law, the teaching, instruction of your mother. They shall be an ornament of grace. Anybody have anything different than ornament of grace? Graceful ornaments in the New King James. Okay. Great, what? Graceful ornaments? Okay. Uh, is anybody wearing any ornaments? Yeah. Necklaces. My smile. Right. Your smile. <laughs> um, earrings, rings. Um, women wear, they wouldn't call them ornaments, it's called jewelry. Um, I might refer to them as accessories. Okay. I wear a hat from time to time. It's just an accessory. goes with the outfit, you know, kind of to make me look a little bit better. Why would you wear accessories? only to adorn and to make yourself look better, therefore to draw people to you. That's what the knowledge and wisdom that your parents teach you will do if you'll put it into action in your life. It will draw other people, good people, to you. Now watch this. It, an ornament of grace under thy head and chains, there you see it, see a necklace, about thy neck. Now, you're going to love this, Jesse. Look at Luke chapter 2. Okay? Okay. Luke chapter 2. And here we see this put into action by none other than our Savior. Now what's this? Luke chapter 2. Let me get to it here. Luke chapter 2. And let's start at verse 51. The back story here. Joseph and Mary and their family go to Jerusalem. Jesus remains behind. He's in the temple. They find him. Now they're returning to Bethlehem. Watch this, verse 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and watch, and was subject unto them the instruction of his father and the law of his mother. He listened to them. He subjected himself to them. And his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Now watch this. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in what? In favor. You know what that word, Greek term is, translated favor? It's pronounced something like charis. You know what that's most often translated in the New Testament? Grace. Noah found grace. Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Why? Because of the way he conducted himself. He had a good reputation. Jesus listened to his parents 
And that knowledge and wisdom he gained from listening to them became an ornament and a necklace that attracted favor from man and God. I'll tell you what, you want to find a good man, you want to find a good woman, you make sure you have a good reputation. Okay, that's number one. Now let's get into a little bit more lighthearted things. Let's go back to Song of Solomon. <clears throat> and let's look again at verse 3. Because of the savor of thy good ointments. Well, that's old King James. We don't talk that way anymore. Anybody have that in the New King James? Read that first part of verse 3. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments. Ah, because of the fragrance of your good ointments. Um, because of the cologne that you wear. You know, you might never think to read the book of Song of Solomon and realize, hey, we're being taught to practice good hygiene. Okay. And we don't have a lot of young men in here, a lot of teenagers in here. Uh, but I've spent time at summer camps and, uh, you know, bless their heart, those teenage guys, you know, you hit camp and the first day they're already looking out at the girls that are there and they're, okay, here's the one I'm going to be talking to. And they, they know which one they want to sit next to at lunch and, you know, at mealtime and whatever. And they're out here running around, playing ball and sweating, and they get back to the cabin, and I don't have time to take a shower, so what do they do? They grab a can of Axe, <laughs> and they just take, and they soak their self down with it, and they go, oh, I'm all right. No, you are not all right. I don't care if you, if you bathe a skunk in Axe, it still smells like a skunk, okay? Young men. And not only young men, what do we do sometimes when we get married? We forget about it. We just take it for granted. Don't do that. The things that we did to endure our wives to us when they were our girlfriends, we need to keep doing, okay? We don't need to take for granted. Ah, I've been, you know, fishing all day and probably smell like fish, but <clears throat> that's all right. That's all right. I get a shower tomorrow. And then we go to bed and our wife, we want to snuggle up to our wife and we smell like fish. Come on. Hygiene. We need to practice hygiene. That may sound like something uh, that doesn't mean much to us. Put it into practice. Look at chapter 6 and verse 6. We see kind of the same thought here. Thy teeth are as flocks of sheep which go up from the washing. What's a sheep look like after it's been washed? It's white, it's clean. Now this is Solomon talking to the Shulamite girl, to his, to his wife at this point. Okay? His wife, she was still maintaining herself. Okay? Make yourself attractive. That's the point I'm trying to make. Make yourself attractive. Let's go back to chapter 1. Look at verse 10. Thy cheeks are coming with rows of jewels. Thy neck with chains of gold. What's she doing? She's making herself attractive. Um, verse 12. While the king sitteth at his table, she's been brought into the banquet hall, into the chambers, we're going to see. That's the banquet hall. And she's wondering, we'll get more into this, uh, am I making the right impression? Okay? Notice, my, my spikener, my perfume, sendeth forth the smell thereof. What's she doing? She's making herself attractive. Now, let's make some, a little bit of application here. Ladies, men appreciate physical attractiveness. Um, God created man, he created woman. He wired us together differently. We're just not the same. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say it. We're not going to get all the way to page five in what I've got prepared here. Uh, the difference in men, and tell me, if, raise your hand if you've ever heard this. The difference in men and women is like the difference in buffalo and butterflies. You ever heard that? Ain't no butterfly. What's the difference in a buffalo and a butterfly? Buffalo uh, stands out in the prairie, right? Uh, what happens when a storm comes up? What's that buffalo do? When a strong wind comes up, buffalo just stands there like a buffalo does. It's not going to bother him. Rain starts to fall, pounding on him. Doesn't bother him a bit. He just walks around like a buffalo. He comes up on a, on a, on a, a valley with these beautiful flowers. And what does he do? He just goes walking right on through them. Just lays down in them and rolls all over them. Uh, you take a, a rock, 
take a small pebble and go up to a buffalo and just as hard as you can, just throw it as hard as you can. What's that buffalo do? He might, now he probably won't even turn around and look at you. Doesn't bother him a bit. Now you take a butterfly. You have a light breeze blowing, what's that do to a butterfly? Uh, you let a, bu a butterfly see a beautiful flower garden and what's a butterfly do? Uh, you take a small pebble and lay it on the wing of a butterfly and what's that do? That is the difference between a man and a woman. Ladies, when your husband seems insensitive, he can't help it. Okay? <laughs> Men, don't let that be an excuse. Learn to be sensitive to your wife. Ladies, help your husband be sensitive. Okay? There are some very distinct differences. Men have been wired together by God. Uh, they appreciate the attractiveness of a woman. Now, let me make this point, and I want to get too deep in the weeds on this for various reasons, one being time. Parents, you teach your daughters this. You teach your daughters that whenever a young man sees her form, it affects him. She needs to know that. She needs to present herself in a way that will not stir up lust in that man, in that young man. Okay? A young man especially, an older man struggles at times even. A young man doesn't know how to, to bridle those things. Okay? And you get a young man stirred up. And again, I'm not going to get into the weeds on this. We talked about the buffalo and the butterfly. Maybe you've heard this. The difference between a man and a woman when it comes to intimacy is like a crock pot in a microwave. You know? I put something in the microwave in a few seconds. Man. And the crock pot is different. It's slow, okay? Now, the point is this. Please teach your daughters that how they present themselves to young men needs to be chaste. It needs to be Christian, okay? Because they don't really understand. Take time and teach them. Take time and teach them. Um, ladies, something else you need to know. Uh, when you present yourself, when you take time to make yourself attractive to your husbands, it boosts his self-confidence. Man. So you're already the most beautiful woman in his eyes. And she's taking time to do this for me? She doesn't have any, she doesn't have any time for anybody else. She didn't get dressed like that for anybody else. She got up this morning. She's taking care of kids. She's not going anywhere, but I come home and she looks like we're going out on the town. Why did she do that? For me. Okay? Sometimes we get married, ain't got to worry about it. Y'all too. Because a man appreciates that. It boosts his self-confidence and it enhances that attractiveness. It enhances that relationship. He will be in awe of you because you're doing that for him. Make yourself attractive. Okay, let's move forward. This might be the last one we get to, unfortunately. I've got about six, partic six you know, points I wanted to make. We're on number two. Here it is. Reassurance. Reassurance. I wonder between the husband and the wife who needs reassurance the most. Well, that's going to be the lady. She needs the reassurance. Look at verse 4. <clears throat> verse 4. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. That's not his bedroom. That's not his bedchambers. That's, uh, that's a banquet hall. It's a banquet hall. Look at verse 12. While the king sitteth at his table. Okay, he's in a banquet hall. They're in a banquet hall. She's a country girl. She's not a city girl. We read of the daughters of Jerusalem. Maybe this was the city girls. What's the difference often between the city girl and the country girl? City girls often uh, live in a society, a higher society. Okay, they have money. Oh, somebody unplugged that. Uh, uh, they're able to pamper themselves. Their parents pamper them. Country girls, uh, maybe raised up around a bunch of boys. Okay, might be a little bit different atmosphere. Maybe out in the country, I'm working out there with the guys. So whenever it comes time to present herself to this man, is he going to be attractive to me? 
I'm doing everything I can to draw his attention. Is he going to compare me to these city girls? Uh, it is my demeanor, the way I've been brought up, is he going to be embarrassed by me? Okay, now that's her mindset here, okay? That's her mindset. She needs reassurance. Look at verse 5. I'm black, <coughs> dark. I've been out in the sun working, but you other girls, I'm pretty too, okay? But comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem. Verse 10, look not upon me because I'm black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards. They, I had to get out and work because my brothers and sisters didn't. I had to do it. But look at this. But my own vineyard, now she's talking about her body, have I not kept? I haven't been able to pamper myself. So now, how's he going to look at me? Am I going to embarrass him? She needs words of reassurance. He gives them to her. Look at verse 8. If thou know not, O thou fairest, look at that, O thou fairest among women, the New King James or rather, uh, the American, New American Standard says, most beautiful among women. Okay? She's saying, I wonder how he sees me. This is all in the song. Well, if you don't know, oh, most beautiful among women, the most beautiful of all. And she has asked, if we go back to verse 7, which we're going to note, <clears throat> um, where, where, where do you cause your sheep to rest? Okay? Where, where do you go? <clears throat> says, uh, if you don't know, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd tent. She's saying you, he's saying you just come and see. We're going to come back to that. <clears throat> Verse 9, notice some words of reassurance. I have compared thee, O oh my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Okay, New King James. Somebody read that in the New King James. Verse 9. I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Okay, what kind of horse do you suppose Solomon had? Best. best one there was. I've compared you to mine in comparison to those that Pharaoh had. You suppose Pharaoh had some good horses? Oh, yeah. He's got the best of the best, except for one, and that's Solomon's. You're the best of the best is what he's saying. Okay, now we might not use that kind of language today, but we can take the principle of it. You're the best of the best. You're the fairest among women. You're the most beautiful woman of the, in the world. You are the best among the finest. <coughs> she had taken care. Look at verse 12. While the king sitteth at his table, my perfume sendeth forth the smell. She had taken special care to make herself attractive. What was Solomon saying? I have noticed. I have noticed. Men, let your wife know that you have noticed her beauty. That you appreciate that she is making herself attractive for you. Okay? Man, so much I want to get to. <clears throat> Let's go back to verse 7. Well, I want to make a strong point right here, and this will probably bring us close to the end of the class. Look at verse 7. Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, this is the Shulamite, girl speaking to Solomon. Notice her feelings. Oh, thou whom my soul loveth. She needs reassurance here. Do you love me the way I love you? Am I attractive to you? Okay. Where thou feedest, thou, where thou feedest, that is your flocks, where do you make them lie? Where thou makest thy flocks to rest? For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? Well, who is this one or who are these ones that uh, turn aside by the flocks of the shepherds. They were veiled ladies. They were prostitutes. Um, my soul longs for you. Does your soul long for me? Where do you go? Why should I be as one that comes seeking after you as the prostitutes seek after your companions? Let me know that I belong to you and you belong to me. And we're still just in the dating side of things here. It's really... Ah. Well, the point being made, let me finish this point. Solomon didn't say, we ought to trust me. He said, come and see. Now let me make this point. You know what I have access to on this phone right here? Men, your wife should have access to your phone. She should have passwords. 
And anytime she wants to check it out to her, say, absolutely, just look at it. Look at my search history. Look at all of my contacts. Look at my text. Reassure yourself that you're my only one. She needs that. She needs it when they're dating, but your wife needs it still. I wish we had time to talk about these other points. Maybe sometime in the future. I appreciate your time and attention. Look forward to the rest of the day.